Vice believers, friends of the base, so good to connect with you again. I trust that you're keeping well. I trust that you're full of faith. And I trust that your love for God is growing every day. Please open your Bibles to Mark chapter 16. We're looking at this basic mandate that's on the church. The basic commission to go out and preach the gospel to all of creation. And so last week we looked at what does it look like to go with the authority of Christ. And we looked at the Matthew scripture of the Great Commission. Now what's fascinating with Matthew's perspective on the commission is that when we go with authority, we go on the legal grounds, the authority that we have to go with. Now Jesus won all authority back for mankind. Adam lost all of it in one moment in Eden, but Jesus came and as a man he recovers, he, he wins back authority for mankind to start to exercise God's authority as God's representative on the earth again. And so what is fascinating with with authority is how you receive authority. The only thing that's needed is you need to be born again. You need to receive the gift of righteousness. When you receive that gift, you've got the authority to start to represent God. Mark takes the same Great Commission and he puts a different lens on it. And he highlights the fact that not only do we go with authority, but we also go with God's explosive resurrection power. Now, what is fascinating about the book of Mark is that both Peter and Paul, two big men of the early church, they have been persecuted. They have died for their faith. And so the early church is like, whoa, this, this, this faith is dangerous. And so Mark is writing these short accounts of power, these short accounts of faith. And he starts off to say, or ends off with saying, even though this faith is dangerous, the power that we have is like dynamite. And so he wants to really settle his, his hearers or his listeners or his readers around this resurrection power that is ours. Now, depending on your background, when it comes to the power of God, you might find yourself very uncomfortable right now. I know out of my conservative background, I knew all about the authority. I heard about all the, the, the reality of being born again and receiving the gift of righteousness. What so few believers know, though, is that the gift of power is a gift that doesn't come when you get born again. The gift of power comes when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so right through the Bible, you see Jesus saying to his disciples, wait, wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Wait for the moment the Spirit of God comes on you, then you receive power. And so you see these two different gifts, the gift of righteousness to get right with God, you get when you get born again, and the gift of power comes on you when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit. But let's read together in Mark chapter 16 from verse 9 and pick up Mark's account of what it looks like when we go with this resurrection power of Christ. It says in verse 9, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him, and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive, and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These two returned and reported to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating, and he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. 
in my name, they will drive our demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Holy Spirit, we need you in this moment. I ask you for revelation. I ask you for understanding. And I ask that as we hear this truth of the resurrection power of Christ, that our hearts would start to burn inside of us. I pray that you'll satisfy those that are hungry to, to walk in this power. I pray that you will move us. I pray that you will, will touch us in significant ways as we listen to this message. And I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So what you find in Mark's account is this account of the resurrected Jesus. He has defeated death and how he's displaying his resurrection realities to, to the people that was close to him. And so what we find fascinating in verse 9 is we find Mary Magdalene. The first time Jesus found her, he delivered her from seven demons. Now, I don't know what it is for your worldview. Certainly our Western minds battle with that. She got delivered from seven demons. She loved Jesus passionately, so much so that she's the first one on the scene to look at the tomb where Jesus was buried, only to find an angel speaking to her. And it says that after the angel spoke to her, she was bewildered and she was trembling with fear. And so when Jesus, the resurrected Savior, finds her, he comes and say, says, Mary, I found you before, I delivered you before, but now I'm coming to also take your fear, and I'm coming to give you my peace. Now what is funny about this, Jesus finds Mary Magdalene, and he settles her in her fear. Mary Magdalene, on her way, goes and finds a whole bunch of grown men crying, and saying, listen, I found the resurrected Jesus, he's alive, but somehow they battle to believe this. What does it mean for us? It means that when we go, when we understand this resurrection power that is ours in Christ, when we get baptized with the Holy Spirit, then we go to effect change. The reason we take the great news of the gospel out is because we want to see people's lives change. When you go out with the resurrection power of Christ, you affect change to people, you bring change to places, you change atmospheres, you change homes, you change lives. And so when we go with this power, we go to affect change. You see, resurrection power is about putting on display the peace and the joy of Jesus. There's so many believers I know that lives without joy. There's so many believers I know that lives without peace. These men and this woman was so close to Jesus. In a way, I can see so many believers, they know about the authority and the legality and they have great conceptual understanding, but they've never been impacted. They've, their lives have never been changed by the reality of God's power, the resurrected power that we have. I know for my life, I grew up very conservative, knew about the Lord, feared the Lord. But in one moment, one day, when I encountered the resurrected Jesus, my life changed forever. Maybe it's a good time to ask yourself as a believer, how much of your life has changed? Since you know about Jesus, since you've come to this knowledge of who Jesus is, how much of your life has changed? I want to encourage you, if your life has not changed, you've not encountered this resurrection power that displays the peace and the joy of Jesus. It goes on to say that Jesus appeared in different ways to the 12 and the 11, or to the 11 and some of these disciples, but they were stubborn in their unbelief. I find this fascinating because Jesus appears and he rebukes them for their stubbornness. What does it say about us? What does it say about when we go out with this resurrection power? It says so much, friends. When we go out with this resurrection power, we go to confront unbelief. 
Don't expect the church or other believers to necessarily celebrate you when you come with God's power because most of them are more comfortable with unbelief than what they are with faith, with what they are with believing that Jesus really defeated death. You see, we can quote the gospel that Jesus suffered, he died, and he rose again. And we can even have the right understanding of what that's all about, but it's till you encounter this resurrection power that you get confronted with the unbelief that you might be living with. You might be going to church, you might be reading your Bible, you might be a great exemplary believer or a Christian, but it's till you encounter the resurrection power of Christ that your unbelief starts to whittle away. And so resurrection power melts criticism and stubbornness away. See, when you encounter this resurrection power from a resurrection, resurrected Savior, all of the criticism towards the church and, and other believers and, and leaders and, and criticism about where God is and what God should be doing, all of that, all that stubbornness to unbelief melts away. I love how in verse 15 to 18, it says that these believers went out preaching the good news. What I love even more is how they redefine what preaching is. Most of what we have 21st century churches, as we believe preaching is just listening to someone speaking. It says that they had a different understanding of what preaching was to do. When they preached, they went out to tell, but also to show the good news of the gospel. Listen to what happened. Listen to what, what Mark says will happen if you start to believe this message, when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, when you receive this gift of power, listen to what he says you can expect to see happen in your life. He says that you will drive out demons. It speaks about getting oppression removed off of people's lives. So much of the Western church don't even believe that people can be demonized. But here he's saying, when you go out and preach this good news, you'll, you'll tell and you'll show. You'll get people free from oppression. It says that you will start to speak in tongues. It speaks about the fact that the freedom that you have, that Jesus won for you, that freedom gets enforced. You start to realize, man, I'm free. I'm so free. I've got a new language to speak. I'm part of a new nation. I belong to a different country altogether. It says you'll pick up snakes and drink poison. Now, please, don't go there just because you want to look at this thing literally. Because what I believe Mark means with this is that there's a radicalness that gets released over your life. You're not intimidated by anything or anyone anymore. When you get this resurrection power and it, and it touches you, you become radical in your witness and your actions for Jesus. And then he says you will lay your hands, your hands, you will lay on the sick. And they'll get healed. See, sickness is a result of the curse of sin. And so when you go out to tell and to show, you get curses broken over people's lives. Sin is not a blessing. Sickness is not a blessing. Jesus died. He gave His body and paid with His blood to get you free from sin and to get you delivered and healed from sickness. And so when it comes to going with this resurrection power, we go to clarify the good news. We go to clarify the good news, not just to tell people, but to show people the good news of the kingdom. Have you ever thought what makes the gospel good news? What makes the gospel good news? Not just the fact that Jesus did it. When you encounter the power, the gospel becomes good news. It's the power that raised Jesus to life that makes the gospel good news. Otherwise, he would still be dead and we would have no hope. We would have no savior. It's the power, the resurrection power of Jesus that makes the gospel good news. And so when we go with this resurrection power, we clarify the good news of Jesus. You see, the resurrection power clarifies that Jesus is the only way. I know there's lots of power out there, and most of those powers are dark. Most of those powers are controlling and, and manipulating and, and intimidating. But the power, the resurrection power, the real power of God, it shows that only Jesus is the way. No other religion 
has the same claims to a resurrected Savior. And when we go to clarify, to show and tell, we declare and we clarify there's only one king. There's only one that defeated death. Doesn't matter what sort of power you got, our king trumps you at every turn. And then I love the fact that verse 20 says that the disciples went out preaching and God went with them. The Lord worked with them and confirmed His word. Did you get that? That means that you need to do the preaching of the word, of God's word, and God will work with you. He will perform the word that you've preached. I can't think of a greater privilege that you get to do the, the talking and God get to do the showing. That you get to do the preaching and God get to do the performing. Why? It says because Jesus went with them. Now, I love this idea. You see, when we go out, we go to tell others about the love of God. What do we preach? What do we do when we go with this resurrection message? What do we do? We simply go and declare there's a great love. We go out to declare this incredible great love of a God that cares so much that He sent His one and only Son. It's a very simple message. You see, when we go out to, to declare this great love of God, God says, I'm right there with my power to demonstrate how much I love them. Paul takes this even further in Ephesians 3. He says, I want you to know that you cannot know the love of God till you encounter the power of God. You see, we don't have to be afraid whether God will show up. We just need to go out and declare of this incredible God that loves so much. When we go out and declare the love, God is right there to perform with power to make His love real to people. You see, when it comes to this power of God, all we need to do is just go out and declare that Jesus loves you more than anyone or anything. It gives God an opportunity to come and perform His work, even when we don't know and we're not sure of what the end result will be. We can simply see the love of God touch people. And so this resurrection power confirms that God's love wins every day. Every time you choose to love on people, every time you choose to share the love, every time you choose to share the love and to spread the love, God's love wins every time. You see, the love of God and the power of God is one thing. How do you know that God loves you? You need to experience this power. And I want to ask you, as you going out, and I trust the Spirit of God is gripping your heart to start to go out and share the good news of this resurrection power that Jesus has and shares with us. I trust that as you go out, you'll start to get testimonies and stories of your own, of how incredibly powerful Jesus is. I want to ask you, if you don't know Jesus yet, what a great place for you to say, Lord, I want to get my life right. What a great place for you to start to call on the name of Jesus. If you don't know Him yet, if you're not right with Him yet, just start to call on Him. I want to pray also, though, for those of us that are believers that, that know about Jesus. But somehow we've got the desire to want to go and, and tell others, but we've never actually done that. I want to ask that Jesus would come on you right now and baptize you with His Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in new tongues. Heavenly language. That's the evidence that the resurrection power of God has touched you. I want to ask you to close your eyes with me if that is you. I'd love to trust Jesus to come into your living room, into your space, and trust Him to baptize you with His Holy Spirit, to baptize you so that you can receive this gift of power with the evidence of speaking in new tongues. And so Jesus, as we humble ourselves before you, we have a claim that no other religion has. We have a king that defeated death. And I ask Jesus, as, as I pray, I ask that your presence would overwhelm people as they are listening to this prayer. I pray for everyone that hears, everyone that listens. Jesus, I ask that you would baptize them with your Holy Spirit and with power. I ask, Lord, for the gift of, 
of speaking in a new language, a heavenly tongue, to be loosed in their hearts, to be released on their lips as the evidence that your resurrection power is available to them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that you baptize your people with fire. Thank you for your resurrection power on them. Touch them, Lord. Touch them, Lord. Transform them, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for people being healed of arthritis right now. I thank you, Lord, that your powerful love brings healing to them. Oh, I thank you that you take sadness and you turn it into joy. I thank you that where people are fearful that the peace of heaven would rest on them as you touch them by your spirit, Lord. I come against the spirit of unbelief. I command you to take your hands off God's people right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We bless your great name. We bless your great name. Father, I thank you for a radicalness on your people again. I thank you that your sons and daughters will glorify your name. Jesus, I ask that you will empower us for mighty exploits. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Bless you, my friends. So good to connect with you. Looking forward to seeing you in real person soon.